Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I'm Brendan Dooley, Professor of Renaissance Studies at um, University College Cork, and um, PI of the Euro News Project, which is funded by the uh, Irish Research Council and hosted by uh, UCC uh, in collaboration with the Medici Archive Project here in Florence and in New York. And we're here to talk about one of the great themes of all times, war and culture referring to humanity's perennial engagement with organized state violence and the cultural ramifications, of this, especially in early modern um, Europe, although I think our trajectories will be um, going backwards and forwards quite a lot during our discussions today. Let me just first say something about the Euro News Project for those um, who may not be per um, particularly familiar uh, with it. Our object is to analyze all the 200 or so volumes of handwritten newsletters that exist in the Florentine State Archive in the Medici papers over the period from the 1530s to the 1730s using, uh, well, a combination of the digital humanities and other, uh, and other uh, transdisciplinary um, approaches. But um, I think for the moment, that's uh, enough about us. Uh, you'll hear more in just a minute. Our guests today include an exciting range of experts in the field of war and culture studies. Uh, in order of appearance, we have um, Dr. Anke Fischer-Kattner of the University of the Bundeswehr in um, um, München, uh, Dr. Lina Mara, Lina, Nina Lamal uh, from the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Raymond Fachel, um, Leiden University, Dr. Regina Maritz, of uh, University of Bern, um, Professor Judith Polman of Leiden University, um, Dr. Amy Lidster of Jesus College in Oxford, Professor Penny Roberts, uh, University of Warwick, and Dr. Michael de Prater at uh, Harris Manchester College. You'll find full details about all of them on our website at www.euronewsproject.org. Good Got it. Uh, hello. <laughs> Under the tab initiatives, uh, where you click on the war and culture seminar, and there you'll find uh, more information about today's session. Uh, this is also where we plan to pay, place the recording of this session when we are done. Um, and we've actually begun recording uh, at this uh, moment, a couple of moments ago. And we thank all of our participants sincerely for uh, agreeing to be with us also on rather short notice, I think. Um, and also thanks to the rest of you for tuning in. Uh, some of the themes for today are sieges in general, uh, war narratives, autobiography, war and memory, war in literature, specific battles, war and diplomacy, fiscal systems, or warfare. And last but not least, uh, the siege of Ostend. Because today, which is, um, by the way, it's the first day of Celtic spring, okay, first of February, St. Birgit's Day. Um, and our Euro News online exhibition goes public today. It's called The Exciting News of Ostend, How Florentines Seize the Siege. Uh, and it's a project, project that we're very proud of here at Euro News. In fact, before hearing from our speakers, um, I'd like to present members of the Euro News team who will say something briefly about the exhibition, which you will find at, again, www.euronewsproject.org. Uh, under the tab exhibitions. So far, this is the only one in spite of the plural. And the colleagues who worked on the exhibition are Dr. Maurizio Arfaioli of the Medici Archive Project uh, and Sarah Mansuti, currently a grad student at UCC, as well as Volta Kreutze, also a UCC graduate student. He just raised his hand. Uh, and also from uh, the Euro News Project, we have Dr. Davide Boerio, and Dr. Gabor Toth. 
Now, the title of the exhibition reflects uh, the source material for this particular research, that is the papers in the Florentine State Archives regarding foreign affairs, and especially news reports about the wars between Spain and the Dutch Republic, where I'm sure our speakers will remind us Italian and more specifically Tuscan soldiers were involved in the action and in the planning. In fact, it has to be said that among the prominent Tuscan names recorded in these actions was also Don Giovanni de Medici, natural son of Cosimo Primo, uh, featured in a book by um, one of the members of our team. Oh, that was me. Uh, uh, by, um, by the time things get going on the field of battle, of course. Um, the head of state in Florence, who was also the bankroller for any special actions regarding the uh, Medici family, as well as Don Giovanni's only savior from inconvenient de gambling debts that he got into. Uh, um, uh, concerning who was gonna win the, the, the battle, that head of state was none other than Don Giovanni's half brother Ferdinand I. But um, I want to pause for a moment on the um, minutiae of Florentine history, because our object here today is to move in a, a very European, pan-European, um, and in some cases even global direction, using techniques in the best traditions of, of digital humanities and the other disciplines. Now, to explain why Ostend is so important, apart from the written reports, the handwritten newsletters curated by Don Giovanni's group, now in the state archives, and even the 3D model sent back by the Don, which now sits in the director's office at the Museo di San Marco. By the way, I think Dr. Tartuferi from the Museo may be with us today, and also Dr. Esther Magrini of the Archivio di Stato uh, di Firenze. We've tried to look beyond the reported uh, 100,000 plus casualties on both sides in that siege, which occurred as the Spanish tried to, as they say, take the untakeable and the Dutch tried to defend the indefensible in a struggle that lasted from 1601 to 1604. It's one of the longest sieges ever. And among the greatest battles of the 80 years war, uh, and to explore this complex and many faceted reality, we've carried out a wide ranging uh, investigation, not only into news, but also into many facets, also the visual culture of this event. But I'm already over my time. So um, let me turn things over to Sarah Mansuti first, who will walk us through the exhibition by uh, using our, I think our handy map of Austin. And then I think uh, Maurizio uh, Arfaioli will give us um, maybe a specific example of an episode and coverage uh, as we've analyzed it in our uh, ex uh, exhibition. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Brendan. I'm sharing my screen, hope you can see it. Uh, I'm glad and excited to present to you the online exhibition entitled The Exciting News of Post and How Florentine Sees the Siege. I sent a link to it in the Zoom chat, so feel free to explore the exhibition while I'm talking. The first page you see is an introductory page. By clicking the Explore the Exhibition blue button, you go to the proper exhibition, this one. We will be happy to receive your feedback on it. Uh, you can write it in the Zoom chat or send us an email. The online exhibition results from a joint effort between the Euronews project team and Maritza Farioli, senior research fellow at the Medici Archive project. The project started with the idea of finding and studying all the handwritten newsletters talking about the siege of Austin held today in the Medici Archive in Florence. Soon we realized that the newsletters were only one component of a broader and multimedia communication framework that transformed the siege of Hostend in a European media event. News and information from and about the siege also spread through letters, oral communication, maps, paintings, drawings, engravings, printed pamphlets, broadsheets, and books. To explore and convey the multimediality, 
of the early model communication and news system, we decided to share our findings, not with a tra traditional academic paper, but with a virtual exhibition. The virtual exhibition has enabled us to simultaneously present the siege from different points of view, guiding the visitors to read and look at primary sources. This type of exhibition also allow us to narrate some micro histories. For instance, the one of Caterina Mas, a Dutch woman, widow of an official of the Spanish army originally from Pesaro who died of illness in Ostend. Through the land exhibition, we hope to have conveyed on one side the impact that the siege of Ostend also defined the new Troy had on the soldiers of both sides, their families and the civilians, on the other side, the exhibition shows the echo that the siege provoked in Europe and the desire to receive and read news about it, even by who was thousands of kilo kilometers away, for instance, in Florence. As regards the technical side, the exhibition is built using Omeka Classic, an open source web publishing platform, and Neatline. And Omeka adds own tool to tell stories with maps, images, and timelines. We designed the online exhibition in a way that allows the virtual visitors to explore the siege from three different points of view. The first one is this beautiful map drawn during the siege by Gabriello Ughi, an artist of, in Don Giovanni de' Medici service and the probable author of the plaster and wooden model of Austin today at the Museum of San Marco in Florence. Ughi sent his drawing of Austin to at least five different courts in Italy. And the one you see here is in the Turin State Archive. The captions and uh, colors added by us on the map reproduce the legend written by Ugi at the bottom of the map. According to the colors used by Ugi, red indicates the Spanish and yellow indicates the Dutch. The second way to explore the exhibition is by going through the records on the left. left. They guide the visitors on a thematic journey from the beginning to the end of the siege. Each record deal with an aspect of the siege, linking and explaining different kinds of primary sources. Here I'm showing some examples. Finally, on the lower, part of the screen, there is a timeline that show all the news items related to the siege of Austin found in the newsletters sent to the Medici. For every news item, there is a synopsis in English, the transcription, and the link to the Medici interactive archive, where you can find the whole document, not only the excerpt about Austin. We created this timeline uh, to show the flow of information about the siege arriving in Florence and to give relevance to the written newsletters, which we consider an important historical source that shaped the early modern information culture. I will now give the floor to Maurizio, who will talk in more detail about some records. Thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me correctly? Yes. Okay, uh, now I will deal, let's say, I cannot go through all the various items. I would love to have the time to explain, navigate the exhibition with you, but I want to uh, tackle the topic of the subtitle of the exhibition, how the Florentines sees the siege. But contrary to very still common opinion, the gaze of the Medici Dukes of Florence and Grand Dukes of Tuscany was not turned inwards. Uh, the Medici looked at the outside world with acute interest. They were gatherers, they were hoarders of information. The number of volumes of, of a visit, newsletters, in the in Archivio Medici del Principato is an ample evidence of that fact. Uh, okay, for the first advisor, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it is thanks to the thirst for information that the Medici and the Florentines were aware that the Dutch revolt was not just a revolt, uh, and by the time the siege of Austin began, the Medici were aware that it was, was already known as the Ostinatissima Guerra della Fiandra, that is the most obstinate war of Flanders, was not just a war, a simple war. Flanders was where the Spanish monarchy was making its bid for supremacy in Europe. 
But who were the Florentines who seized this, the Great Siege? In other words, who were the people who sent all that stuff to Florence? I point here to four main categories. Uh, open, the, okay. There is observers, uh, merchants of the Florentine nations. Uh, there have been a Florentine mercantile nation in the Nolo countries starting from the 14th century, first in Bruges and in, in uh, Antwerp. And they were sent information constantly to Florence. Uh, they were uh, made, uh, more among the ones who sent a visit to Florence. Then there were soldiers, professional soldiers. Can you go to the list? Uh, let's say uh, professional soldiers, Florentine soldiers that went to the low countries and the army of Flanders, that was the most prestigious army of Europe and served there. It was their job or their choice, or sometimes they were exiles. Uh, and then the avventurieri, that is the young men of, of uh, gentle blood who serve in the low countries because of the reputation of the army of Flanders. Gentlemen serving voluntarily, at least initially, at their own expense, either to prove their courage before settling down at home or to earn their chops as soldiers in view of a prolonged military career. An extreme example of that was phenomenal was Don Giovanni de' Medici, the bastard brother of Grand Duke Ferdinando, an already established military professional who did not go actually to Ostend or not just to the siege of Ostend. He went to the great siege of Ostend. When, by the time he was there, it was the great siege. It, he wanted to a, a, piece of, a piece of it, let's say, a piece of the action. But there were also uh, other uh, people like tourists, the real life tourists, you could say, like Ottavio Rinuccini, who was the, the first librettist, uh, first opera librettist of uh, all times, that was working uh, uh, in Paris for Maria de' Medici, Queen Maria de' Medici. And uh, he was following the practice and ideas of the Camerata de' Bardi, a group of literati uh, that gathered around Giovanni de' Bardi di Vernio. And he went to Ostend just to have a look at the siege and uh, go back home. But it was so popular that uh, even an artist, uh, somebody who was neither a soldier nor an aventuriero, decided to have a look at the great siege of Ostend. And also artists like Gabriel Ughi, uh, who uh, painted, who draw, made this beautiful map, and then the, uh, three, the 3D model, you could say, of the siege of Ostend, and send it to his master in Florence, but also to other of his possible masters in Mantua, Turin, uh, Ferrara, and so on. Together, uh, these men, all these people, merchants, uh, uh, soldiers, aventurieri, artists, produced a combination of easy letters and drawings, models that we are presenting in this digital exhibition, hoping for you, uh, for it to be enjoyable and useful to you all. Thank you. Uh, thank great. you, Maurice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mauricio. I think that was uh, that was very interesting. That's been like a, an introduction both to our project um, as well mm -hmm. as to Ostenden and this. Each of okay, and then okay. now it's time for another very uh, exciting part, I think, of this afternoon, and that is the the round table. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well, and my connection is not uh, too unstable. Um, so. Maybe we'll first explain how it will work. So we have eight speakers today. Um, we're very happy uh, to have here and very proud. So I'm very honored uh, also on behalf of Euronews uh, to present these speakers to you. And each of the speakers uh, will speak for uh, 10 minutes. And after that, uh, of course, there will also still be time uh, for questions. So if you have a question um, during one of the talks, either write it down or, or uh, in the chat, which you can find below, or, um, well, don't, but make sure you remember it and ask it uh, by raising your hand. And I mean, especially the visual hands provided by Zoom, which you find likewise uh, below near the chat as well. Um, and I remember the speakers, of course, that they can feel free to share their, sc their screen, of course. Um, so we're kind of a, on, a, on a tight schedule because we have so many uh, exciting speakers today. 
So I propose that we would just, uh, without more further ado, just start with our uh, first speaker, who is Dr. Anke Fischer Katner uh, from the Universiteit der Bundeswehr uh, from Munich. Um, so I will leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. Um, I will use the opportunity to share my screen and then hopefully also yeah. let you see just my presentation. Um, thank you very much to Sarah, to Brendan and all the rest of the Euronews project for inviting me to this round table. And um, since I was the last to come in to this wonderful round, um, I, I wasn't quite sure what is expected and now I'm even the first one <laughs> to present here. So um, I hope um, that what I have to offer can give something to the project and maybe to our discussions here. Um, I wanna start with a couple of conceptual reflections for the cultural history of early modern and maybe even not only early modern warfare by suggesting that we place siege history. There has been a recent upsurge in attention to violence and warfare in cultural history and the online exhibition on the exciting news of Ostend really exemplifies the huge potential of such an approach. Um, yet for a surprisingly long time, this topic has not been taken up, especially in Germany, where I come from. From the side of cultural historians, war was counted among the all too well-known Haupt- und Staatsaktionen, the main topics of classic political and military history. From the side of military history, on the other hand, particularly in Germany, practitioner, practitioners um, had been rather slow in adapting to the turn towards social history. Um, so they were only starting to explore the common soldiers and military organization when cultural history was already flowering and around other topics. So eventually, um, attention for the experience of war and war's representations then laid the ground for the exciting new approaches that can be taken and are being taken today. My own current research topic is early modern sieges and fortress warfare, um, exemplified by the fortress of Philipsburg on the Rhine River, which you can see on the right. Um, and this topic, early modern sieges, is obviously taken up much more widely at the present moment. The importance of sieges is no longer overshadowed by 19th century preferences for battles and rapid army movement, but now positional warfare is taken seriously, as it was a main concern of contemporaries. So how can we approach this topic in cultural history ways? One exciting field is obviously media and representation. Um, Yet inherent in this perspective is, I would say a certain distance in observation, not just with us, the historians being distant, but also the observers at the time that used media. Um, and the very peculiarities of warfare pose challenges for us here. In war practices could sometimes have very existential consequences. So there, is a slight discomfort with too much distance in cultural history um, or military history for that matter. The contemporary historian Michael Geyer has, for example, um, voiced a critical intervention in 1995 and he demanded that history of war should actually talk about death. Now, as a cultural historian, I do see a certain danger of being trapped in the trenches, being caught inside a military logic here, so I would like some conceptual safety line and I think I have found something that I can work with very well. Um, so what is my suggestion? It is place. So I suggest we transfer a theoretical approach developed in anthropology and geology and which has been usefully applied for microhistory um, and apply it to the history of sieges and warfare. The foundation was laid by the works of the anthropologists, for example, Tim Ingold and Arjuna Padurai, whose works you can see on the left and right here, but also by geographers, among them, John Agnew, who has um, contributed an important essay in the center um, publication. 
all these contributions um, argued that placemaking is difficult work and it, it's also the foundation of culture. If it ceases, places are simply lost. And I have found a striking example of a lost place. This is the ghost town of Pripyat um, near Chernobyl. And you can see nature sort of taking back this place, even though one might argue that tourists going there at the moment take part in another kind of placemaking. So place is the more tangible, more human alternative to the very theoretical concept of space. And place, placemaking involves dirty practices rather than just abstract, no, abstract notions of social relations. And therefore it seems pretty suited to the dirty materialities and complex actions of fortress warfare. Um, again, I have chosen Philipsburg. This is the siege of 1676. And for the dirty practices, this is what the town might have looked like. So um, the historiographical use of place has been um, proven by the Italian historian Angelo Torre. And he employed the concept in a microhistory approach. He connected local practices, in, the, in his case, those were mainly legal and um, religious practices to a wider contemporary world. So kind of like what the um, online exhibition on Ostend is doing in another medium. <laughs> and Tore gives us a couple of very useful characteristics of place. For him, places are both constructed and constructive factors. So they're made by humans, but they also um, set a, a certain stage for what humans can do. They are co-produced by those in power and by subjects. They are linked with, but not determined by larger, even global flows. And this is where Apadurai and um, even Manuel Castells come in. They are both social and material, and they allow for resource mobilization. And we all know how important this is in war and warfare. Um, and they offer new perspectives on sources, on primary sources, and require interdisciplinary exchanges, just as we are engaging in right now. Um, so I think these, this concept, places, could be made profitable for the history of warfare and violence. But we have to face two challenges, in my opinion. Um, the first is that there is a popular notion of static of um, an aesthetic um, difference between in and outside in siege warfare. And this appears to go against the dynamics and circulations stressed for place making. Um, and another example from Philip's book um, that shows this um, sort of more static conception um, are, is this type of siege plan, which is very typical for siege representation. Um, it stresses the blockade, the lines, and the fortress being um, locked in by the besiegers. The second point, which can also be exemplified by this um, image, is that warfare is not so much the construction, but rather the destruction of places. So let me quickly deal with these two challenges before I um, leave it to other people. The first, non-circulation was certainly the goal of any blockade. And this was an important means of forcing a defending garrison to capitulate. And um, by the way, Ostend only turned into such a lengthy affair because the blockade didn't really work and the, the harbor remained open for so long that the defenders could actually defend themselves for more than three years. Um, all primary sources of on siege warfare demonstrate a huge concern of military leaders with circulations. So they always worry about communications and control. And um, they did this both in the, in the siege and in the capitulation again. Um, so looking at place and circulations opens up our attention to these facts. Let me go to the destructive side of warfare. This can certainly not be denied. The lost villages of the Thirty Years' War very much point to the capacity for unmaking places and the destroyed walls of Philipsburg and other places do the same. But there was also material construction going on, for example, in preparation for sieges, when they were repairing works and building new ones. Um, 
And it also took place when spatial reconfigurations were going on, when works like the Ravelin in front of the attack front here um, changed hands. So there was construction besides destruction. And moreover, circulations and human movements in sieges themselves shaped the besieged city as a very special kind of ephemeral place, I would argue. Within this context, new circulation played a crucial part for placemaking in warfare. New circulation helped, for example, the simple Episcopal residence of Philipsburg to become a kind of household name, not as much as Ostend maybe, but also quite well known throughout Europe. And this took place through the operations as well as the reporting on them. So in very brief conclusion, I would suggest that the exploration of placemaking as a concept can connect the histories of war and culture really well. It allows us to integrate practices of representation with other more directly violent practices of war. And I'm very curious to hear what my um, co-roundtable panelists um, have to say to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, uh, Anke fischer kartner I think it was very uh, interesting talk, indeed a very valid point about place that we, I think many of us actually are looking for like different uh, perspectives uh, to look to war and to, to study war. And then now we have like a, a small change in, uh, in the program. So we will now go directly uh, to someone who I'm actually very uh, pleased to announce because um, actually once he has been the supervisor of my master thesis, and then I'm talking about uh, Dr. Raymond Fago from Leiden University. Uh, Raymond, the floor is all yours. Yes, thank you, Walter. Yes, uh, thank you for inviting me. And of course, it's for me it's a great pleasure to see you here working in this new environment. And you seem very well in your place here. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to see you amongst us. Well, for the last years, I've been dedicating much of my research to the early phase of the revolt in the Low Countries. Um, resulting in a series of publications in Spanish, Dutch, and English. The central idea of most of my research is the importance of what I call episodic narratives. Narratives that could also be qualified as merely anecdotical. There's so much material on war to be found in the chronicles that it has often been considered too detailed, voluminous, and heterogeneous to be studied. We all know the pages long descriptions of sieges, battles, sacks, etc. These descriptions have often been disqualified as being too descriptive and unconclusive. But I think we can make good use of these texts, especially because of their descriptive and detailed character. And therefore, in my research, it's the anecdote or episodic narratives I use material from all kinds of different sources, including any form of anecdotal content, ranging from the letters of the involved military themselves, the information reports written directly after the events, the chronicles written at different moments in time, but also the theater plays written in later centuries referring to the same military and to the same events. The episodes even bring me to study current historical novels on the revolt in the Low Countries. Just last week, I received a copy of a recently published novel on the revolt by a Dutch author, who has taken up one of my main protagonists as the villain of his books. He has used my work on commander Julian Romero, in which I've tried to offer a nuanced view on the Spanish officer, but he then decided to stick to the old idea of Spanish military as being extremely cruel and inhumane people. So essentially, we could say that even my work and his use of it have become part of a string of episodical narratives related to this particular commander. Another essential element of my work is the connection between the history of Spain and that of the Low Countries. If possible, I try to compare the Spanish sources of the revolt with those from the Low Countries. And of course, Spanish military commanders are generally treated more positively in Spanish sources and more negatively in the Dutch ones, but it is an oversimplification of the situation. The sources cannot be divided simply by the boundaries of modern national states and modern nationalism. And if possible, and times allows it, I also try to bring in French, English, German, and Italian sources. 
For example, Mondouche, the French ambassador at the Habsburg court, almost always brings in refreshing viewpoints on the events in the Low Countries. Not believing the stories, telling that the accounts had been exaggerated, etc. However, I do have to admit, and this hurts me a little bit, that I've not yet made sufficient use of the material in the Medici archives. I'm very sorry, but this has to be done in the future. My research connects with other research fields, such as hemagology, Maori studies, and the history of news and media. But the focus on the episodic narratives may hopefully add another perspective to this much broader field of study. As it's not my intention to fill the time for the round table with my monologue, I shall limit myself to summarize some of the conclusions of the project regarding the functioning of war narratives. Studying the episodic narratives in Chronicles is always about choices, what to include, what to omit, what gets more attention, what gets less attention. Dutch Chronicles clearly emphasize victories of the rebels and successfully defended cities, while the Spanish Chronicles do indeed focus on royal victories and successful sieges. As such, any chronicle, or for that matter, any news pamphlet is always a subjective text even when the text itself, itself seems very factual. But these texts only give away their secrets when you compare them in detail. The same process can be traced regarding the historical actors. Failing Spanish commanders are protected in the Spanish chronicles and their defeats are even turned into victories. Though one of the commanders was taken prisoner by his mutinied soldiers, the chronicler had him leave just in time to avoid his very dishonorable imprisonment. But it would be unnuanced to say that the Spanish narratives are only preoccupied with the defense of the Spanish image. Within the Spanish government and army, there clearly existed a party that tried to defend and put to the fore the actions of the Duke of Alba in the 60s and 70s, the governor general of the Low Countries, and his close relative related officers. For example, Commander Sancho Davila is highly praised in text written at the time of the Duke and directly afterwards, while posterior chronicles are much less positive about, it, about him. And there are many more examples where the names of important commanders are either highlighted or occluded. It becomes clear Alba had his own propaganda policy, not directed to win the hearts of the Dutch, but to win the heart of the King and his closest advisors. Even with the Battle of Jemingen, Still going on in 1506, Alba already sent a letter to the king putting his own deeds in the best light possible. A relation, a news pamphlet, on the same battle must have been made directly afterwards based on the letter from Alba to the king, as the text is almost a perfect translation. Comparing both, it becomes clear that personal elements were taken out. For example, the letter by Alba speaks of the troops starting at dawn using the Spanish word Alba, while the pamphlet refrains from this small Alba joke. The pamphlet is also made more spicier by playing with Topoi about the terrible Dutch heretics. Interestingly, we possess another Spanish pamphlet on Jemingen in which the Duke of Alba was not the center of the description. And it was even said in this pamphlet that Alba had remained far away from the battlefield. It shows Alba was right in trying to make his claim to fame as soon as possible. It was a race to the desk of the king. At Jemingen, Alba also immediately sent letters on the victory to all the important people in Italy. Again, showing the importance of Italy for the Dutch revolt. After the Battle of the Mokerheide in 1574, we can find, besides a Protestant pamphlet, very critical of the Spanish, two different news pamphlets from the royal side, both in Spanish. One is almost completely centered on religious aspects, while the other is a mostly military story. One was written in Brussels on the 17th of April, the other in Antwerp on the 18th. Again, we can imagine a race as to which letter would reach Philip II. The Spanish fury at Antwerp shows how narratives can change over time. In the 16th century, the fury was described as a military confrontation that led to the brutal sack of the city. The differences between Protestant and royal narratives was mainly visible in the amount of space dedicated to the one or the other. After centuries, the narrative that is dominant nowadays is that of a violent sack of the city by mutineers. 
the whole battle preceding the sack has been totally forgotten. The explanation for this process cannot be other than that violence by mutineers against innocent burghers fits the general conception of the Dutch revolt as seen by anti-Spanish propaganda. And this in the end formed the nucleus of the Dutch national image of the revolt. Stories that do not fit the general image have a tendency to vanish. I would like to end with one conclusion I certainly had not expected. The still very positive image of two of the main Spanish commanders in Dutch memory, Cristobal de Mondragon and Francisco de Valdez, can be traced directly to the Dutch theater plays written at the end of the 18th century. Both these men play the role of the only good Spaniard. The exception, in the case of Mondragon, this positive perception was based on a good reputation already during his lifetime. But in Valdez's case, it was a completely new invention of the 18th century. As these plays focused mainly on the local or regional context, we may state that these more local developments have had an enormous influence on the images existing today. There remains much more to be said, especially when including the letters written by the commanders themselves. But I hope it has become clear that zooming into the factual stories that can be found in the sources, the mechanisms of the storytellers become visible. Following them through time and place and genre, what seem to be rather factual and anecdotal stories that have often been overlooked are in reality a very good way of understanding the functioning of the early modern world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raymond. And he, uh, yeah, I remember like the little book of Julien Romero. I think you once gave it to me, though I'm not the one who wrote the novel, so don't blame me. Um, and I think there are some similar concerns to the ones that we have in Euronews about that, for example, very simple text uh, might not necessarily uh, be objective and that there actually might be something behind it, even though they try to appear objective. Um, luckily, we still have uh, a lot more on the program, so I'm very now very happy to announce uh, Dr. Regina Maritz. Um, I give the word to you. Yes, thanks so much. Um, I'll just also try to share my screen. Great. Um, here we go. Does that work? Okay, excellent. So, well, yeah, first of all, thanks so much to Brendan Dooley and the team at Euronews um, for having me. Um, it's really exciting um, to see this um, online exhibition, just particularly at this time, um, when we all really have to think about new formats. So um, I will try to be extremely brief um, and, and say something about how, for me, war um, functions as an analytical lens, um, which I use to investigate pre-modern concepts of body and personhood. During the research for my PhD in first monograph, I've become increasingly interested um, in the history of, of the early modern body and how it's connected to personhood. I have pursued this in interest in my investigation of self-narrative documents written during or in the aftermath of warfare. So these sources, they're particularly suited to my interests um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, of course, because relatively speaking, there are quite a lot of them, um, because um, no doubt, of course, their transmission was favored by the fact that war um, is one of the founding subjects of our disciplines and any document um, that contains reference to it um, has a better chance of surviving in the modern archive. So this means that we also have access to some of the first person voices of women, and other subalterns that we might not ordinarily be able to trace in this manner. And secondly, um, because warfare, and in particular the 30 years war, of course, um, fought in the Holy Roman Empire, which has been um, my recent focus, is generally well studied. Um, it is possible to contextualize such narratives quite well, um, and we can determine um, what perspective specific authors were writing from. Were they actually eyewitnesses? Um, do they describe events after the war? And so on. Um, recently, investigations of self-narrative documents um, written in the context of warfare have broadened our understanding of the experience of warfare and in particular, of course, its emotional impact of contemporaries. Historians such as Sigrun Haudem, Martin Dinges and Andreas Baer have shown that feelings of vulnerability and terror were omnipresent for many contemporaries and this important work allows us to radically reject older historical narratives and unfortunately also some more recent voices in popular history 
um, that portray the pre-modern world as being populated by brutalized subjects who have often grown relatively indifferent to excessive violence, particularly um, when committed in the name of religion. Um, it is, however, not the whole story for if one approaches self-narrative writing, and I want to be clear, I use the term we very liberal and includes um, practically all writing that consistently or even occasionally uses the per first person perspective um, with a view to how body and personhood appear in these narratives then and this is my tentative argument we can also observe some very specifically early modern strategies of resilience in the face of the overwhelming disorder that was brought on by warfare and so questions that interest me when considering my sources is whether um, the writers include references to their and other material bodies and if so what narrative functions such references serve. As always in the pre-modern period, the body is usually experienced and described as enmeshed with personhood and vice versa. And therefore, an extension of my line of questioning also interrogates how writers situated themselves within the action of warfare. Did they actually claim to be eyewitnesses or um, were they clear on the fact that they recorded facts from secondhand sources and did, did physical distance with events change um, over a particular documents? These are things that I look at. So I thought I'd just briefly, very briefly introduce just two um, examples, um, just um, to give you an idea um, of, of, of how, how I work. So one of the, one very interesting chronicle, um, I think, is, um, is one um, by Maria Anna Junius, um, who um, is a Dominican, um, um, a, a Dominican nun, and um, she wrote um, a very classic, in some ways, um, monastery chronicle. And, um, on the, on the Dominican monastery Heilig Grab or Holy Sepulchre that is just located, was just located outside the city of Bamberg. And this monastery has this really famous name on the basis of a legend according to which um, a traveling student in desperate need of money had stolen a silver cyborg full of, um, full of hosts from the nearby St. Martin church. And he laid down um, the hosts in a field and fled with the silver vessels. And when the hosts were found, they were accompanied by the apparition of a beautiful child and could only be left it up by the Dominican bishop. And so a chapel was built on this land that was then incorporated into the monastery. And on the basis of this, Junius confidently wrote in her chronicle, our monastery has stood here for nigh on its 300 years. God the Almighty has rested here and he chose this place um, to be his holy tomb, end of quote. And so for clearly um, space was really important. And I think you're already here have a connection to um, the first paper we've heard. Um, so this connection to space was extremely important. And Junius records um, throughout the um, the chronicle how her community had escaped attacks because they chose to remain steadfastly in the monastery instead of fleeing behind city walls of the city walls of Bamberg or elsewhere, as did much of the population um, surrounding them. And Junius included descriptions of the many um, atrocities that the population suffered. And as a result, her account has previously um, often been interpreted as an example of how extreme violence could really um, challenge the belief in an underlying divine order. Um, and um, I think there's part of that in the account, but there, there's also other things I think that we have to account for. And um, for instance, in the final pages of the account, we have this really, I think, very striking, um, striking um, paragraph um, where she um, is at pains to really stress that she and her sister has had managed to retain their corporeal integrity throughout the difficult years. I can testify in front of God that not one sister of our convent has experienced anything that would endanger her virginal state. Although the Swedes walked in and out of here, they showed themselves chaste and respectful towards us. At times they approached us as if they were fierce lions and beasts. But as soon as they saw us, and the spoke with us, they turned into patient and gentle lambs. So um, some of this sanctity of the Holy Sepulchre does appears to have also infused this corporeality in the narrative of Junius and her sister. And the embodied quality really allowed them to um, resist the very worst ravages of warfare. And so secondly, I just um, want to brief, finish with a very brief um, reference to a well-known diary written by the mercenary soldier, Peter Hagendorf. And so, because we have few of these um, testimonies, it's of course often cited um, on, um, in studies on the cultural history of early modern warfare. And his narrative is very remarkable for a number of reasons, but perhaps most striking because um, it gives evidence of such great mobility at this time. Um, and Hagendorf um, and his family, um, they completed extreme distances um, throughout um, the Thirty Years' War. And Hagendorf um, even participated in the very well 
well-known sack of Magdeburg and um, in, in May 1631. And he there fought in the Pappenheim Regiment and on occasion he was bravely wounded um, by two bullets and he recorded the event as follows. The physician bound my hands on my back so that he could bring in the gouging instrument. Then they turned, they brought me to my cottage half dead. I was heartily sorry to see the city burn so terribly, for it was a beautiful city in my, in my fatherland. But as I was now bandaged, my wife left to enter the city, although it was burning everywhere. She left in order to fetch me pillow and clothes for my bandages and bedstead. The sick child was lying beside me as well. I was more worried about my wife on account of the child than because of my own damage. But God protected her. After an hour and a half, she emerged from the city, accompanied by an old woman. And so in this brief extract, um, what I think is significant, or what to me is very interesting, is how Hagendorf um, alternates um, between an account of the treatment of his in injuries and the damage that is being inflicted on, on the city. So he goes back and forth really and, um, and really very closely brings those two topics um, into association. Um, his wife also, of course, looks to the city to offer up um, what she needs um, to help Hagendorf's recovery. And, um, and so we also have in this way a, a really domestic scene in some ways that is intertwined with one of the most famous and notorious events really um, of the Thirty Years' War. And as we know, um, early modern corporeality was not really fixed on the, the skin envelope, so to speak, um, of an early modern person. And I think here we really see how this corporeality can also expand to encompass a much larger event. The narrative that suggests um, th the effect of Hagendorf's wound here is um, is seen as equally far reaching as the sack of Magdeburg. And as a result, it was clearly no danger um, to, um, of this soldier's person being drowned out by violence and the chaos of war. So um, just to sum up um, very briefly, um, I investigate self-narrative documents written in the context of warfare in order to find out more about early modern concepts of body and personhood. Some tentative early findings of this work um, confirm what previous studies um, have suggested about the permeability of early modern bodies and the relational nature of personhood at this time that was really constructed much more through networks than through interiority. What is more, I believe that these specific parameters offered self-narrative authors interesting ways of speaking about their own and their community's resilience. I have tried to show very briefly how the deep connection Maria Anna Junius and her Dominican sisters felt with their convent on both a material and spiritual level um, allowed them to make very confident claims about the power relations in their interaction with Swedish soldiers. Peter Hagendorf intricately enmeshed his account of a serious wound with the notorious sect of Magdeburg and thus insisted, of course, also on the relevance really of his and his family's experience of the war. So with this work, I hope to make a contribution to broader histories of the experience of warfare, and in particular to insist that the pre-modern concern with community, be it spiritual or otherwise, did not necessarily result in an attitude of terrorized helplessness or even indifference in the face of overwhelming violence. Many thanks. Um, uh, as you and already said, like uh, we saw again, uh, more attention being paid to place. And I think um, also in narrative, we see that during this afternoon, uh, this will again return. So I'm very curious how this will develop. And maybe also there will actually be questions about this very interesting aspect uh, during the Q&A after uh, after this round table. And then our following speaker, who actually had the privilege of following lectures uh, when I was an undergrad, and that is Professor uh, Judith Bollmann from uh, Leiden University. Um, thank you very much, Wouter. It's a pleasure to see you here and indeed uh, to um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I was also really happy that we could see a preview of the wonderful exhibition, which I um, uh, took um, some time to, um, uh, to see yesterday. Um, uh, and I just want to congratulate uh, on, uh, you on it. It is um, really wonderful. I learned a lot from it and I will definitely also be sharing it with uh, my students. So uh, that's great. Um, one of the reasons why I learned so much from it is that um, the history of the siege of Ostend is not very well known in the Netherlands. Um, remarkably, um, even in the most recent handbooks on the Eighty Years' War, 
um, or in Jonathan Israel's History of the Republic, or on the Dutch Revolt website. Um, the siege of Ostend is, of course, mentioned, but um, it is really not um, made a great deal of. Occasionally, the word epic seems to, is dropped in the description, but not really to explain what was epic about it. Um, and even in the uh, very recent uh, Dutch uh, military history, which is published by the um, uh, Institute for the Study of the Dutch Army, um, they, they do actually say something about Ostend. They also say, they, they, they explain why something needs to be said about Ostend. This is clearly not self-evident, but then also go on to discuss it primarily in terms of what Dutch strategists had to do about it, um, rather than to tell the gripping story that emerges from your exhibition. Now, um, uh, this extends also to uh, imagery. Uh, I did a quick check yesterday. What does the Rijksmuseum have on its wonderful website? Um, only very few images of the Siege of Ostend. Um, the account by Philip, Philip Fleming that you're using touch to such good effect for the exhibition. I've worked with many diaries, but I had never heard of it. I looked him up. He's not uh, on a separate entry on the Dutch Revolt website and so on. So that raises, I think, the rather obvious point that um, lasting uh, memories of war or of um, episodes in wars do not simply emerge from the conflicts themselves or indeed from the existence of a copious news culture. So even though contemporaries may be following the news of Ostend um, um, closely, and I'm sure people were in the Dutch Republic, um, the fact that there, is lot, there was lots of news about it at the time doesn't mean that it therefore made a lasting impression on um, new generations. And um, I've been thinking a little bit about um, uh, why this may have been the case with Ostend. Um, I've done so with the toolkit, you might say, that we developed when I was directing a project on memories of the Dutch Revolt um, called Tales of the Revolt uh, between um, 2008 and 2013 with a group of scholars and that I've, I've since uh, followed up. And one of the things that we, um, a pretty obvious thing perhaps to, uh, to think about is that um, for memories to last is um, that um, uh, they need stakeholders. Um, individuals or communities that um, give them for which they mean something and who want to remember. And um, you can see that um, in Ostend's case, um, there was nobody left to remember it. Uh, that is to say in Ostend, almost since the city was a complete, completely destroyed, um, there was really nobody left to have local pride or sorrow or commemorate or whatever um, in the city itself. Um, that is, um, that's important because it's, this has happened to some other cities where you think devastating uh, losses are, but there are almost no accounts, for instance, from the inside that have survived. And the second um, point is that um, uh, when we think of... Um, um, stakeholders, obviously winners tend to be greater stakeholders in uh, memories of war than the losers. And since the Dutch lost this siege in the end, um, obviously there wasn't um, the, the incentive to um, uh, talk a great deal about it uh, may not have been as uh, large. And I think it is a major reason why um, uh, Dutch histories have tended to uh, uh, present it on the background and rather foreground, for instance, the victory that uh, the Dutch had at, New, uh, at Newport um, in uh, 1600, which is a famous date in uh, the, the history books of uh, what is fundamentally, of course, the same uh, struggle for control of the Flemish uh, coast. Um, but um, at the same time, it's also obvious that it wasn't com com forgotten immediately, not as soon as it was lost, as it were, because as I'm sure uh, uh, the, the team who've worked on this have made uh, extensive use of Anna Simoni's um, uh, work on Hendrik van Haften's accounts of the 
um, Ostend, and of course, in the midst of the, uh, you know, after 10 years later or so, he publishes these extensive um, accounts in the Dutch Republic, um, uh, which um, are beautifully illustrated um, and uh, have been very influential indeed in our uh, perception of what happened there. Um, so, um, uh, on the other hand, um, we should note that Van Haften's own reputation in the Netherlands wasn't particularly good because although he, he was a relatively recent immigrant there, he had come there in the late 16th century, but he also left again in the 1620s, moved to Louvain, became a Catholic again, and therefore that in, in many ways discredited his authority to subsequent uh, Dutch historians. So, uh, you know, Ostend was already having a hard time, you might think, think as, a, as a loss, uh, and the main um, uh, publisher who had um, uh, publicized it uh, 10 years after the event um, also uh, was discredited, and that certainly didn't help. Um, nevertheless, there were, of course, uh, military uh, stakeholders. Um, the... Um, uh, you can see that uh, while um, the, uh, the, the siege was undecided, um, certainly news about what happened there uh, was uh, widely shared and also led to the immediate creation of some uh, memory um, culture. Um, the um, uh, Newport uh, memorabilia were um, uh, great and um, even though uh, Prince Morris, um, the, uh, from, well, he wasn't a prince yet at the time, he was a Stadtholder Morris, um, the commander in chief of the Dutch um, was um, uh, um, not very much in favor of the campaign at Newport. He couldn't uh, resist commissioning um, this. I hope you can, uh, I want to share a picture with you. Um, there it is. Um, he um, had um, uh, taken captive the horse of Archduke Albert, um, and he had this in uh, 1600 and had um, um, this image made of it in 1603 when the campaign was still ongoing, and he was obviously trying to uh, make his point. This was uh, commissioned from Jacob uh, de Gein. The painting is in such appalling shape because it's, um, it was forgotten subsequently and was sub uh, eventually left uh, folded on an attic um, in, the, in a palace and was only restored a few uh, years ago when it was used in a major exhibition um, for, uh, the, on the Dutch Revolt in the Rijksmuseum. But it does, um, um, its, its existence reminds us that um, uh, the meaning of... Um, um, uh, war to individual reputations is, of course, um, also an, uh, an important uh, motive for uh, creating memories. And uh, horsey memories are particularly in evidence uh, when it comes to Ostend. Um, the um, 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 in in um, uh, as early as 1606, um, tourists in Brussels reported that they could see there in the archducal stables the hide of the horse that um, Albert had um, uh, used uh, while fighting uh, before Ostend, and uh, the hole of a musket shot was still in it, um, was being reported. Um, and it was paired there with another hide of another horse on which his wife, um, Isabella, had um, uh, um, sat when uh, she and the Archduke together had first entered uh, Brussels in 1599. They had at that occasion made a conscious decision to enter the city seated on two genets, white genets, white as snow, because allegedly because a prophecy had said that there would only be peace in the land once two sovereigns had entered the city on white horses. So they had staged their own entry according to this prophecy to make a big impact because of course for them this was a big reputation uh, builder. And um, these um, 
the white horse um, uh, became, uh, you might say, immediately part of a bigger strategy that um, uh, is the third factor, you might say, why memories um, are likely to stick. Um, in Albert and Isabella's case, the uh, memories of Ostend were, of course, the memories of an enormous victory, but they were also framed in a bigger picture, a bigger picture that wasn't just about, um, uh, about war, but that was also uh, very much about religion and the, uh, the role of their of the Habsburgs in safeguarding um, the Southern Netherlands for uh, Catholicism. This is um, evident in the uh, great career that um, of the, 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 the events that um, um, unfolded as uh, Luc Durlo has uh, described for us um, during the campaign for Ostend in Scherpenheuvel, the, a small uh, place not so far from the Dutch border, where in an oak tree, an image of the Virgin Mary appeared. Um, that was attracting, it was seen as a miracle. It was immediately attracting um, visits from students and also from the archducal pair who made a vow there that um, if they were to win at Ostend, they would build a shrine, which they subsequently did. And the shrine, uh, therefore, in some ways, also became a lasting uh, testimony to the victory of Ostend. And there you can see that the bigger story um, propped up with, um, you know, the big, with a bigger frame, as it were, for this memory, propped up by telling details. One of the miracles reported at the shrine is of a woman who had been possessed by the devil and had been so crazy that she predicted that Ostend would never be won. When she had eaten a little bit of uh, wood from the um, uh, miraculous tree at Scherpenheuvel, she was freed and of course, happy to see eventually uh, the archducal victory. So um, you can see there that um, war and um, memory in this instance um, uh, go together um, when a number of conditions are being met. The first is that there is somebody left to remember. Um, the second is that there are stakeholders um, who, um, uh, for whom it's meaningful to um, develop and transmit memories. But third also, that there is a frame in which memories beyond the stakeholders, you might say, uh, take on continuity and a longer life than that of the people who were there to uh, see it through. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much again for the talk. I think it was very uh, captivating. And I especially did like the idea of long-term impact of the sources uh, that we use and maybe I also think about more often. Actually, to be honest, indeed, before this project, of course, I knew the siege of Austin by name, but I also I, I wasn't that familiar as I maybe should have been. Um, since we're on a tight schedule, I, I, I propose that we go on to the next speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Amy Lidster uh, from uh, Jesus College, Oxford. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I will just share my screen. Um, I hope you can all see that. Um, okay, so uh, I'm, uh, I specialize in early modern literature in English and um, I have two main uh, strands of interest. Um, one is in the, the interplay between history and news and plays during the early modern period. Um, often in the ways in which uh, publishers uh, invested in um, all three categories of text. Um, so uh, topical news books alongside histories, alongside plays that uh, either dramatized history or current events. Um, but I'm talking today about my second strand of interest, which is the way in which early modern texts, and in, in this case, Shakespeare, um, have been used in the centuries since then. Um, so this is a, a short um, talk about Shakespeare's afterlives um, going from the, the 18th century um, to, to the 20th and 21st century. So um, I'll begin with uh, an extract from this article uh, printed in the Times in 1915. 
The effect was electrical. Had the bugle sounded the charge, every man would have rushed out of that building on the instant as he was. All the latent warrior spirit of our race seemed to leap to a flame. As we went out into the still night, our hearts were stronger, our minds brighter, our courage high, and in the quiet stars above brooded the certain promise of victorious and lasting peace. So this was printed as the reaction of an enthusiastic audience at a production of Hamlet at the front performed by the British Expeditionary Force. It makes a claim for the direct impact of culture during wartime and specifically Shakespearean theatre. The production featured four scenes from Hamlet, but ended with the appearance of Henry V and the famous once more unto the breach speech. So what we have here is a hybrid play patched together using different scenes. And it's Henry's speech that is in particular claimed to revitalize the audience's latent warrior spirit. But the account is also at pains to show how the entire process of staging Shakespeare, from sourcing copies of the play in France, to finding costumes and making scenery, united the soldiers in the service of another national cause, as the article puts it, the great thoughts of our great writers, and provided those on the front with food for the mind. But the report of Hamlet at the front is carefully invested with a narrative and tonal coherence that may be more attentive to readers of the newspaper and their desires and expectations than to documentary accuracy. The article was contributed by an unidentified correspondent who is in the audience and behind the scenes at the same time. They see the audience's response, but also the actions of a careless gunner backstage who accidentally smudges out of existence a whole tower of Elsinore when his shirt sleeve makes contact with the still wet scenery. The playfulness of the account is politically invested. Uh, as if the ease with which the gunner obliterates the painted tower reflects optimistically on the conditions of war and its progress. The account has a narrative unity and an impossible omniscience. The, the correspondent described the entire production process, including the experiences of the soldiers, the aims of the performance, and the united and uniform response of a seemingly homogenous audience. So I'm uh, currently working on a project called Wartime Shakespeare um, and writing a book about the wartime role of Shakespearean productions uh, from the 18th century to the present. And as this short example suggests, I'm particularly interested in the methodological problems and questions this project raises. Uh, we have to rely on partial accounts, partial both in the sense of favouring an agenda and existing only in part or being incomplete. When we evaluate production design and audience reception and impact, there's a temptation to conflate evidence of a production's design with how it must have been received and to assume that surviving accounts such as this one from the correspondent in the Times accurately and comprehensively reflect a wider audience's views, or that the evidence of a collective audience response is equivalent to those of individual members. Um, writing in the aftermath of the First World War, Paul Valery described what he saw as the intellectual and spiritual crisis of Europe, the roots of which were somewhat obscure because, as he put it, the difficulty of reconstituting the past, even the most recent, is quite comparable with the difficulty of constructing the future, even the most immediate. The prophet is in the same quandary as the historian. Histories of war, as we know, are a contested ground. Not only is there a, a wider range of evidence, agendas, and absences to take account of, there's also responsibility in the construction of narratives of war because they can entrench division and the foundation of new crises. Histories of conflict also retrospectively shape the position and impact of culture during wartime. And as part of this project, I'm interested in how the history of Shakespeare at war has been written and constructed over the centuries by a range of individuals. And these are not just the, the key political players. Shakespeare offers a useful looking glass for considering the interplay between war and culture because of the cultural capital that he has posthumously accrued and how often he's been used uh, or mobilized during periods of conflict over the centuries. 
In my research, um, I've identified three broad categories of use that seem to dominate. Um, they're certainly not mutually exclusive and they don't fit into a neat linear trajectory. Uh, one, Shakespeare's plays are sometimes used to offer pointed wartime applications um, and political commentary to comment specifically on the conflict. Uh, for example, a performance of Julius Caesar by the American company during the War of Independence advertised Brutus on its playbill as a renowned patriot who fought for liberty from tyranny, and this was directly applied to the ongoing conflict. Uh, second, uh, sometimes there's an emphasis placed on the figure of Shakespeare as a combative cultural symbol. A headline in the Daily Record and Mail during the Second World War read in capital letters, Shakespeare beats Hitler. Uh, this was in reference to a series of lunchtime productions of Shakespeare by Donald Wolfert, which was performed in London during, uh, even during air raids. And third, Shakespearean productions are sometimes presented in a way that seems politically uninvested uh, to evoke a pre or post-war peacetime context. During the Second World War, the British government invested in theatre for the first time through the newly established Council for the Encouragement of the Arts and Music, or SEMA. Uh, SEMA made a short film about its wartime activities, which, which was sponsored and distributed by the Ministry of Information, which featured a production of The Merry Wives of Windsor, one of Shakespeare's plays that seems least invested in wartime application. But this play was carefully chosen. Clips of the audience show a socially mixed gathering of civilians and service people laughing, relaxing and enjoying themselves. And this kind of apolitical Shakespeare is something of a, a misnomer. It's very powerful because it can work as an ideological glue during conflict that doesn't advance a politic application, but encourages audiences to take what they will from Shakespeare and from culture. So in all of these examples, though, um, Shakespeare does not perform one role and the agendas of production and reception agents are diverse, a uh, diversity that's often at risk of being lost when constructing narratives of conflict and culture. So to give one example from the First World War, Shakespeare's plays were sometimes staged by Britons um, held in Hooligan. Um, and which was a civilian internment camp in Germany. So in April um, 1916, um, the uh, intern civilians arranged a tercentenary Shakespeare festival that aimed to entertain, educate and boost the morale of those in the camp by suggesting their shared ownership of Shakespeare. But these same productions were also useful for camp authorities who allowed accounts of the festival to pass outside as a means of countering allied uh, atrocity propaganda. So there were claims that living conditions in Ruliban were particularly poor. Contemporary reports um, and photographs of tercentenary performances appeared in a number of newspapers, creating the impression that internees could enjoy cultural pursuits and that their living conditions were comfortable. Um, as suggested in this enthusiastic letter, um, by um, uh, an attorney, which was written in um, April 1916 and printed one month later in the Manchester Guardian. Adding to this complicated picture of Shakespearean reception during wartime, it's also clear that some internees disliked Shakespeare and thought he was too highbrow, unappealing or ill-suited to the conditions of internment. And they sometimes expressed their misgivings in the camp magazine. But because of the difficulty in keeping personal records of life uh, in the camp, accounts of the theatre's wartime role and reception are distorted in favour of those which the uh, German authorities deemed acceptable uh, to pass outside the camp and those written retrospectively by released internees. These memoirs were overwhelmingly written by the upper to middle class internees, the uh, public school boys that Walter Butterworth here privileges above others in the camp and these individuals tend to be firm advocates of an edifying repertory of serious plays, which misrepresents Shakespeare's appeal for this quite literally captive audience. 
So as I've quickly tried to outline, Shakespeare has been put to a wide range of uses during wartime. Even a single production serves a range of functions that are only partially documented and preserved. And casting a spotlight on these methodological problems is important and doesn't, I think, undermine our efforts to understand the role of culture and the arts during conflict. One final point or question I'd like to end with is the issue of whether a Shakespearean production or other cultural product ever changes someone's views during a period of war, especially during a period of what we might call total war. From my research, um, wartime theatre tends to affirm an individual's views, whether they seem to respond in line with the production's design or interpret the, the play against the grain and put it to their own kind of use. Wartime Shakespeare tends to work by reinforcing and affirming. And I'd be interested to hear from others if wartime culture in their fields and archives has prompted individuals to change their views uh, during a period of crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I think it was like, again, a very uh, different perspective uh, on the same matter, even though of a uh, long memory in the, in, in the use uh, of uh, of Shakespeare. And as they say, uh, literature, of course, like holds its own truth. Maybe that's more, uh, that's truly more than uh, than just one way. Uh, then I would now like to move on to the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Professor Penny uh, Roberts from the University of Warwick. The floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you very much for the invitation to this really interesting um, Fascinating discussion of, of war and culture, and I hope, uh, hang on, I'll just get my screen up. Um, is that come up okay? Um, and what I want to do is to take you now to France uh, during the French Religious Wars, which is the um, period that uh, I study, and I want to particularly pick up on um, the idea of battlefield culture. I was asked to talk about violence but it's such a broad subject so I'm going to, there is going to be some violence there's even going to be some death but um, there are two particular themes I want to discuss in relation to uh, battlefield culture um, and we'll see they may not seem connected to begin with but I'll show you how they are connected um, the first is around the sort of etiquette on or around the battlefield um, the expected conduct particularly when commanders are captured and uh, the second is um, theme is the carrying of correspondence in battle. Um, and this is uh, sort of interconnected, as we'll see, with some of my um, own more recent research, inadvertently, in a sense, brought me here. Um, and I want to begin with the Battle of Drew, which is actually um, on your screens here, and uh, specifically to the two um, commanders at the time. Um, at the battle, uh, the Prince of Condé, uh, the Huguenot Protestant commander was captured and taken to the Catholic commander, uh, Francois de Guise. Um, and the story goes that in, um, in keeping with chivalric conduct, um, Guise treated Condé as um, his equal, if not superior, and they got along so well in that tradition of kind of international chivalric brotherhood that they even shared a bed together in the camp, uh, which always amuses my students, um, because that was the kind of the only sort of uh, most comfortable um, uh, place that they could uh, stay. So there's very much this kind of emphasis on the idea of um, chivalric conduct. However, within a few months, um, the Duke of Guise would be assassinated in February 1563. Um, at the time of the Siege of Orléans, he was on his way back to the camp. Uh, so he was assassinated in cold blood um, by a uh, Protestant soldier, Contre de Merret. And then some years later, the Prince of Condé was himself assassinated at the Battle of Jarnac in 1569. Uh, having um, been wounded and trapped under his horse, he surrendered but was nevertheless uh, shot. Um, so we see a complete contrast here, obviously, in the way that these, uh, these sort of interrelationship. Um, so these are violent deaths, not as a result of battle, but as a result of confessional conflict, as a result of feud, 
Uh, Condé and his commander Coligny were blamed for the assassination of the Duke of Guise. Um, and of course, this is a period of, of, of civil war. So that sort of all feeds into uh, this sort of um, cultural shift, if you like, in what's happening on the battlefield during the wars. And we also can also contrast the treatment of the two. Um, so when the Duke of Guise is, um, dies, his, his body is, is fated as a Catholic hero. He has a very grand funeral in Paris. His body is processed through major French towns. His assassin is executed. Um, in the way that though only those who commit the most heinous crimes are by being sort of pulled apart uh, by horses. In contrast, the Prince of Condé, as you can see in the depiction here, was stripped and his body was put over the back of a donkey, very much an act of humiliation and was paraded around. His assassin was not pursued and indeed was a member of the um, Duke of Anjou's entourage. Um, however, poems and songs were produced on both sides, Catholic and Protestant, both denigrating and celebrating um, Condé, uh, both as a kind of, sort of martyr and uh, obviously as a sort of rebel as well. So we see again within the kind of wider culture and the literature and people have been talking about that, we see the sort of uh, echoes of this, these events. And these are not unusual either during the wars, these kind of cold blooded assassinations, if you like, um, alongside actual uh, warfare, um, is, is, is not uncommon. And indeed, in later in 1569, another Huguenot, um, a lieutenant of, of Admiral Coligny, the Sir de Mouy, was assassinated by Mauvert, who, was, who would later be the would-be assassin of Admiral Coligny at the beginning of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. So there are lots of interconnections here as well. Another interesting feature, and this is what brought me into, in, into uh, interest in this, in this topic, an interesting feature of the, uh, the, the Prince of Condé's death, um, was that nine letters were found on his body. One in his, his gauntlet or the um, sort of sheath of his sword and the rest in the um, uh, poche des choses, so his, the pockets of his stockings, uh, quite literally. Um, and I don't need to uh, tell you all, of course, how vital a form of communication um, letters were for passing on intelligence to armies, the whereabouts of um, the enemy, where your reinforcements were coming from and so on. Um, but of course, there's also a need for discretion in the passing on of these messages, which might fall into the wrong hands and, um, and how these might be sort of carried discreetly. And this is, feeds into my own uh, current research topic, which is around sort of carrying a clandestine correspondence. A nice example of this comes from the um, siege of Rouen, uh, where these particular letters were sent on the lining of doublets. So they were actually written and either sewn into the doublets or written on the doublets themselves. And you can see how they're shaped by uh, sleeve holes and so on. Um, so obviously this was a way of concealing such messages. Again, they come from uh, Admiral Coligny to his commanders at Rouen. Um, and um, some of them are actually copies as well. So they send several to make sure that at least one might get through. Uh, so if your pockets are searched, you won't find anything. But obviously, uh, if, if it becomes known that this is one method, and obviously the fact that these survive suggests that they may well have been um, actually uh, intercepted. Um, but they're a nice example of, um, and the only examples I know of actually sort of actually being written on uh, cloth in this way that have survived. But um, back to the sort of Prince of Condé's, uh, his, the, Letters found on him are, are kind of more normal, if you like. They're, they're kind of fairly, fairly full size. Um, they include, um, as I say, quite a few of them are from uh, Admiral Coligny, informing him about the companies, there's a list there, uh, and also a, a sort of uh, passing on letters that he'd received from other commanders. Um, it includes uh, a letter from the Queen of Navarre, who's based at La Rochelle at that time, there's um, a, uh, a letter describing what's going on in Paris. You can see there's a sort of ripped letter here as well. Um, and there's uh, a letter from England, from the Sir de Manger, which you can see on the uh, right there, which interestingly is dated the 9th of January. So it's two months old, this letter. It makes me think he's been carrying it around, thinking I need to respond to this at some point, a bit like those emails you never kept quite get around to. Um, and it's interesting that he should have it on his person because you'd think 
that in a in a battlefield situation, these prob the letters you're carrying around are probably the ones you've just had passed you, rather than you're almost acting as your own bureau. Um, so this is, I think I find it very interesting uh, that he's got this this array. The one on the left there is much more like the kinds of letters I'm used to seeing, these intercepted letters, which, as you can see, written in very small writing on relatively small strips of paper, which can be easily hidden away. So that's a, a different kind of uh, sort of letter, if you like, rather than these more conventional types. And I must admit, uh, on seeing these, and they're in the Bibliothèque Nationale collection, and it says on them that these were found uh, in the pockets of the Prince of Condé when he was killed. Um, I was unsure or a bit sceptical about whether this was really the case, um, and um, then it might just be anecdotal that these were found on him. But actually, there is corroborating evidence from the time uh, from the correspondence of um, the Duke of Anjou, the king's brother, writing to the king and to his mother, Catherine de Medici, um, saying that having captured Condé, they found these letters on his body and actually um, sort of giving a sort of shorthand account of, of, of what they were. So that sort of corroborates that these, these were indeed found on, on Condé's body. Um, another feature of them is um, the stains. And um, hard to tell with the, these particular letters whether they're, it could be ink, it could be mud, it could be blood. Um, that one on the left, at any rate. Um, and, you know, without a kind of forensic analysis, I can't sort of tell you for sure, uh, but obviously the fact that they're taken off bodies uh, suggests that they might have, have, have picked up other kinds of, of, of stains in that way. And I was discussing this with a student of mine who works on the Thirty Years' War, and she immediately said, oh, that's nothing, because you, you should see this one, um, which I think is, is maybe familiar to some of you because it's quite well known, I think, which is the letter that was found on... Um, uh, Pappenheim's, uh, Colonel Pappenheim's body uh, that was sent him by Wallenstein to go and go and um, fight at Lutzen uh, in 1632. So um, sort of a sort of a later example, if you like. Um, so I'm, as I say, I'm very interested in, in letters, letters which, are, which are carried around at this time um, on the battlefield. And we only know about them, of course, because they were found on dead bodies at the time. Um, it's perhaps not particularly surprising because of the situation they're in, the kinds of letters which are telling people about manoeuvres, as with the Pappenheim letter. But I'm curious about these other letters which Condé is carrying, which just don't seem to be that immediate. But so why are they still on his person? Um, you, you might imagine that they might be um, passed on to his, his followers, or, or contained in a, um, a bag or a chest somewhere rather than being carried around. So I, I'm kind of quite curious about this. So in, in a way, I'm sort of bringing it to you, not because I particularly have any answers about it, but to find out from you, in a sense, if this seems rather less surprising to you um, and, and how commonplace it is actually to come across these letters that, um, that, that come from directly from the battlefield and, and may not just reflect the particular culture of the, of the sort of battles that are taking place at the time. So that's um, where I'm going to leave it. I'd like to know whether this is normal practice or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Roberts. I think uh, these letters are both uh, fascinating and eerie to see, but also especially uh, fascinating. And even though we don't really treat letters per se, we still have a lot um, to do with letters. Uh, because they very often occur in a manuscript newspaper. So I think it really was a, a fascinating talk. So thank you very much. Uh, then we still have two other talks. So um, we'll just go, we'll go to the next one, which is by Dr. Michael de Preder um, from the Harris Manchester College uh, of University of Oxford. Thank you. Um, I hope you can see my screen decently now. Yes. Uh, perfect. Um, so yeah, I've been uh, invited as a representative of another parallel project, um, the European Fiscal Military System um, between 1530 in Grosso Modo and 1870. 
Um, this is more an economic um, history project and a cultural history project, um, but I do hope to show you where we might um, intersect. Um, so I'll briefly um, present a project, um, uh, my role within it, and then I go on to where we do intersect on news and information. Um, so the there we go. Um, so yeah, the project is led by Professor Peter Wilson, and we're six postdocs working on it at the moment, with also one uh, project administrator. Actually, one of the postdocs uh, just left uh, for a permanent position at UCL, um, but is still involved in one of the case studies, as I will tell you. And so our goal is to study um, fiscal military within a fiscal military system and to question the idea of the autarky of states, uh, early modern states, financing war through taxation and operating in autarkic ways. Um, and rather than that, we think of them as working within a system in which they rely on common pooled shared resources uh, within what would be a unified, potentially unified, at least international European market for fiscal military resources. And we, and in that sense, they are in competition, like polities are in competition with each other, but they also need to cooperate. Um, and so we've distinguished five types of resources um, called assets um, in which um, these states uh, deal. These states are also semi-states, um, semi-sovereign actors deal. The first is manpower, um, so human resources, infantry, cavalry, men uh, to send to war. Um, the second is uh, money, credit. Um, a third one is materiel. Um, a fourth one um, are services. Uh, one can think of um, barracks, uh, ports, uh, or port infrastructures, um, where all these men uh, need to transit, banking systems uh, through which the money transits. And the last um, asset is information or knowledge. Um, and these assets are traded, uh, sold and negotiated um, within uh, fiscal military hubs. Um, and to speak of a hub, one needs to see at least a certain degree of concentration of um, centrality um, where uh, in such a place where those assets would be traded. One can also um, probably see some degrees of specialization as well in some hubs, some hubs specializing in that or that asset. For instance, the Baltic, um, where it's been actually quite difficult to distinguish one uh, city at the moment, studied by um, Kathleen Sarti, one city as a hub, I mean, um, would be more um, specialized uh, in, mat in military materiel. Um, Geneva, on the other hand, specializes in um, credit, as will be probably unsurprising, uh, studied at the moment uh, by John Condren. Um, Michael Martoccio studies Gen uh, Genoa, um, and he focuses on Genoa as a play, as a transit place, uh, especially for manpower. Um, Vienna is really, seems to be really an information hub, um, studied by uh, Kati Pataki at the moment. Um, and then London takes over uh, from Amsterdam in the 18th century as more of a central hub, um, or at least pivot, maybe not a central hub, but a pivot of the system. Um, and so I am responsible for studying uh, Amsterdam at the moment uh, after my predecessors, uh, Jeanette <laughs> um, Thank you. And um, Marianne Klee. And so, what is Amsterdam um, as a fiscal military hub? Um, it seems to take its origins rather unsurprisingly from Bruges via Antwerp um, to Amsterdam. Um, and actually, I really enjoyed um, looking and like browsing through the um, online exhibition last night. Um, I think it shows some elements where Antwerp still plays a role um, 
for at least for men and information and we'll come maybe come back on that um, and so yeah congratulations on uh, the exhibition as well i really enjoyed that um and so in the 17th um, century um from 16 1600s 1620s onwards um amsterdam really um, takes over as a fiscal military, as a central fiscal military hub. And it probably, rather than being isolated, it tops a network of cities in Holland and um, more broadly in the Low Countries, um, including even Liège, uh, the Prince Bishopric of Liège, uh, known for its small arms production. And so, what we can see um, in Amsterdam is definitely uh trade in manpower um and uh trades in um material and production of material as well um guns gunpowder ships uh army equipment uh different packages um that would be sold in bulk um to infantry and cavalry regiments um that are not necessarily as i said produced in amsterdam itself um, but also in the cities surrounding Amsterdam, Amsterdam really centralizes, or Amsterdam merchants, such as Louis de Gier, the trade family, um, centralize um, the trade in um, what is produced. We also have connections with uh, Jean Cursus uh, in Liège um, for the arms trade, uh, gunpowder arms trade. Um, yeah, a uh, third asset that Amsterdam um, seems to be important in is, is a credit market, um, unsurprisingly, as uh, studied by um, James Tracy and Wanche Fritschi as well, um, about um, Holland's tax revolution uh, in the 16th century, which allowed for very favorable interest rates. Um, so Amsterdam uh, is central in that as well provides services as well, obviously, as a port city and an important banking center. And finally, um, provides or is important for the exchange of information. Um, and as Cle um, Lesger has showed, um, Amsterdam is can be considered as a stable market um, for information, maybe even more than for goods um in the 17th century and um, so what information then is useful um for um fiscal military purposes um it's first about um men about recruiting manpower um and so it's the knowledge about how to draft and how to uh, make fiscal military contracts um, it's also information about prices. What should we? What should one pay for those men? Uh, what should one pay for the goods? Um, that can be both informative, but also possibly regulating um, information, regulating uh, and possibly capping prices. Um, information about credits um, and about interest rates. Information also about different technological innovations, um, especially in the field of um, naval warfare, but also in the field of artillery and small arms production. As I said, Amsterdam um, can't really be considered to be operating um, insularly um, in an isolated way. Um, and especially The Hague seems to work um, rather as a binome um, to Amsterdam as a diplomatic city um where diplomats uh, would exchange this type of information um whereas the practical side would then be handled um in amsterdam uh, by merchants and so who are the men and media um transmitting um this information um in 17th century we're mostly looking at merchant and diplomats of different um alloy uh, of different uh degrees uh, of importance um, and looking at correspondence um, at their news letters, uh, but not only. Um, and sometimes uh, one finds really interesting uh, information um, that seems to be anecdotal in the whole um, set of 
um, new stream, um, but that actually concerns prices and one, one wonders whether that is um, something that just creeps in there or that was desired by the person uh, receiving a newsletter on let's say events about a siege um, such as the siege of Ostend. Um, so yeah, um, another type of um, news media um, besides the newsletters that we would be looking at um, are of course books, books about tactical innovations um, and of course Amsterdam is the central, uh, one of the most important, if not the most important uh, 17th and early 18th century European uh, printing center. Um, so in, the, in that area as well, in the area of military technologies and military knowledge, um, it also produced a lot of uh, information. And so I hope I've been uh, relatively short. Um, and I thank you and look forward to um, exchange some more information with you. Thank you very much. And I think indeed, uh, there's again, a very different approach, uh, which is very interesting to see all these different ways of studying uh, a subject. And also like, like the idea and need of like the connection between two cities, uh, such as Amsterdam and The Hague. And then it's now already time for our last speaker of today, who is uh, Nina Lamal uh, from uh, Huygens ING. Uh, Nina Lamal, I, uh, I give the, I leave the floor to you. Uh, are you there? Uh, I, I think you're still muted. Okay, can everyone see my PowerPoint? Yes, yes, yes. perfect. Um, there we go. So first of all, uh, thank you all for the invitation. And I think um, to me, it's wonderful to see all these Avisi and Austin. No, sorry, yeah. Nina, we are seeing all your screen, not just ah, the PowerPoint. Okay, this is not good. Try to share again, but only the, yeah, the, the program. One. Is this better? That's that's perfect. Okay. Yes. So that's captured on camera for eternity. That after two years of pandemic, I'm still not used to like sharing my screen. Wonderful. Um, that's very privileged, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was saying it's wonderful to see all these Avisi and Austins on um, on a timeline especially um, because I remember the days in the archive that I was trying to decide what to transcribe from those Avisi in, in a Word document whilst I had too many espressos as a, as a newling uh, arriving in the, the archive in Florence. So this is just me reminiscing a little bit about uh, those wonderful Avisi. So I've worked um, on the Italian interests uh, in the um, revolt in the Netherlands um, so not just the Medici, but looking much uh, wider at different Italian states and different Italian players and uh, unraveling why they were interested, why they wrote about this conflict and what they received um, in terms of information. And um, I'm currently finishing my monograph, finally, on uh, my PhD research. So uh, this should be coming sometime soon. What I quickly discovered while doing my research is that actually the soldiers and the military officers on the ground are important sources of information for these Italian states and for the Italian dukes. Um, but they had not really been considered as a distinct group or an important group of informers in our history of news and information. And they were uh, key players and important men in uh, shaping the reception of these events. Um, so um, I think uh, I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes in a sense. It's a, it's a quote from uh, Giovanni Francesco Ferranna, who wrote an instruction letter for uh, a young Roman nobleman, uh, Caetani, who was instructed in 1584 when he was leaving to go to the Low Countries um, that he had to understand the state of this war the things they undertake, the things they plan to undertake in the service of the king so that he would be able to write 
the letters to give information on the things that happen in those provinces. So it was very uh, crucial for um, Caetani to have pen and paper ready on the battlefield, or at least as close as possible to the battlefield to actually be able to relate what was going on and what was occurring on the battlefield. This letter of instruction also has a lot more information about what he needs to write down and how he has to deal with the postmaster and make sure that his letters are sealed um, so that he um, does not, uh, that the postmaster is not able to actually retrieve information um, from um, his letters. And so um, one of the things, of course, that we uh, can see is that Caetani was a member of a very important Roman uh, noble family, and some of his letters have survived. And this is the case with a lot of the letters also included um, in the Medici archive, where, of course, Don Giovanni de Medici, he was an important member of the Medici family, and it's normal that these letters have been um, uh, come down to us in archives. Um, and so we have much more letters written by prominent men from the battlefield than we have letters that were sent to the battlefield. There is some kind of imbalance when we think about um, what is left to us as historians to work with from the battlefield itself. And so a few years ago, I was lucky enough to um, go to Frankfurt where there is a post museum and they have uh, something we all love to see. It's uh, letters that never arrived on uh, their destination, but were found in the 19th century in a post bag um, that was left somewhere and recovered. And so these contain, and I have some images here, these contain lots of letters uh, sent by uh, people from the Italian peninsula uh, to relatives um, or other members um, of important families. Uh, to the battlefield. And so you can see it, it always says Al Campo Fiandra. So it indicates that these people um, were on the battlefield and were receiving and expecting letters. So there is this, um, it's a tiny uh, glimpse in uh, the exchange that somehow has been lost a little bit to us, where we can see brothers writing um, that they had heard horrible news about the siege of Antwerp, where we had these massive ships. Um, that the uh, rebels had sent out to uh, explode. And so that news had arrived in Italy and we see brothers writing um, to ask whether um, their relatives are actually still alive. So we have this snippet of war information impacting on uh, other people's lives as well. Um, so this is one of the aspects I think is fascinating when we talk about war reporting and news reporting. Um, the other thing, of course, that we know is that a lot of letters are lost in the sense that I have a lot of references um, of diary writers on the Italian peninsula writing that they receive letters from their friends, including letters from Ostend, or that they write down that um, um, they didn't receive letters because orders had been given by uh, the Duke um, Albrecht or Spinola to stop writing about the siege of Ostend. Because of course, during the first uh, two years, things didn't go according to plan. Things didn't go as swiftly as they wanted it to go. And so a lot of soldiers, even low ranking soldiers were writing um, back home, were writing about how horrible the conditions were in the trenches. And so at some point there seems to have been um, a, a ban on uh, really writing about what was going on uh, during the siege. Um, these are the few things that I um, wanted to highlight. I don't want to like extend too much um, uh, into our uh, limited time. The other thing um, that I find interesting, and uh, I think uh, Professor Roberts touched upon it already with the interception also and carrying of secret letters, is that we actually know um, that the letters of Don Giovanni de' Medici were also intercepted by the Dutch States General uh, at various occasions. Um, and they were uh, translated and sometimes even read in the States General. And uh, to my surprise, some of them are still in uh, the archive in the Netherlands, um, where there is a, a, a folder with intercepted letters. Um, and so it's interesting to see how they were also um, trying to get hold of letters that were going from the battlefield to Florence, 
but actually ended up in The Hague because they thought it would contain uh, important military maneuver information. So there is this whole, I think, network of people that are involved uh, also during this stage in intercepting um, these letters, sometimes on purpose and sometimes by accident. We know that soldiers sometimes just rob the postman for fun, um, in a sense that they didn't always know whether it would contain important information. Um, so this is what I really wanted to highlight uh, in this very brief and not very coherent uh, thought process about um, the siege of Ostend. And I think the last thing I want to highlight is the importance of maps uh, to try and understand what is going on on the battlefield. And there are many, many sieges um, that I have come across during the revolt that soldiers do send maps along. Sometimes they're beautifully illustrated, sometimes they're very rough sketches, but I think it is because it can give people a sense of what is important uh, and to understand the terrain. And I think uh, a much later example, but one of my favorites is that um, the Venetian ambassador, uh, Suriano, has to relate to the Prince, uh, Prince Maurice in the 16th 1617, how things are going in the war in Gradisca. So we're moving to the Mediterranean. And Maurice doesn't know what the terrain is like. So he goes into his library to find an atlas to actually look more into detail into the terrain. And then he instructs the ambassador to explain um, a bit more about the siege. So I think it helps people with military experience to actually um, think about what is going on and uh, complete the narrative to uh, a, a very specific uh, space and location. Um, so these were some of my thoughts. I look forward to um, hearing more uh, during the round table. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to you. I think it was a very interesting talk in which you touched upon very uh, several very important uh, topics that we often deal with, just what is being preserved, either be it through the control of information by authorities, but also maybe just the dy dynamics of uh, dispatchment itself. Um, so thank you very much again. And uh, hereby, I want to thank all the speakers, both on behalf of myself, as well as the whole Euronews team for your wonderful contributions. Uh, I think it has been a very, very interesting afternoon or and culture from uh, many, many different perspectives. Uh, and now, luckily, we still have time for questions. Uh, if people don't mind, we will maybe, because we went a little bit over time, maybe we'll continue a little bit longer than we originally planned. Here I would like to repeat, if you have a question, uh, please put it in the chat or raise your hand, uh, whatever you prefer. Actually, I already see that some hands uh, already uh, have been raised, so that is great. So I just uh, think we will just go directly do that. Uh, Sarah, um, would you like to ask your question? Yes, sure. Thank you for your presentation and talks. I have a question for all of you, but especially for Dr. Fagel, Dr. Maritz, uh, and Dr. Lamal, Nina. And um, so we are studying in the Euronews project, uh, the newsletters, the written newsletters, which are uh, news sheets uh, with a list uh, um, of uh, news items, uh, very short uh, news item. Usually these sources are used to understand the, the, the information system around Europe or to um, read the, the events that happen at the time. I would like to know if, do you think that these sources could be also be used to um, analyze the narratives and how, if even if they are um, mostly anonymous uh, documents, uh, if uh, these uh, document, the newsletters could also be used uh, to study how events uh, are narrated uh, as you are doing uh, with uh, uh, chronicles uh, or uh, other documents. Thanks. Ah, don't worry, Regina, maybe I will write you the, the the question in an email later. I think you can. 
I think that's what I've done as well for um, understanding how the war is framed to an Italian readership. Um, the newsletters are my first point uh, to see what is going on, and then you can trace how the story moves. Um, so I think it's a combination of letters and newsletters, and then how the story gets constructed. Um, and uh, the isn't the anonymity of the newsletter a limit because we don't know the authors no but the more you see you can tell their viewpoint and that already says something and gives you something of a point uh, to see how they narrate events and some of the italian ones you can clearly see they have been translated from german and are somehow a little bit different. Uh, it's hard to, to like pinpoint what it is, but I think I think you can, especially with like the huge sets of, of data you have at your disposal. I think you can do that. Um, and I think that Raymond's uh, concept for that with episodic narratives is very useful. And I'll leave the floor to the rest now. Thanks. Yeah. One thing is that, of course, uh, it's clear that more than one newsletter in reality is a normal letter that has been translated and transformed, anonymized. Uh, but in the origin, it has been a letter to, to, to a certain person. So I think the difference between newsletters and letters is not that large. So uh, in the case of my sources, I think even Italian newsletters might show that they come from the side of the Duke of Alba or from his enemies, uh, for the commanders that they're mentioning, the, the role the, the, the governor has. So I think you can find something about this, the origin of the letters if you can um, look at it carefully at the details and compare maybe even to the letters written about the same anecdote, the same story. Thank you very much. Are there others that still want to uh, add something to this, or maybe some of the Euro team uh, news uh, member, Euro news team members? I wanted to say, or no? Oh yeah, Brendan, do you want to add something? No, just to say, I, I um, you know, I agree with um, uh, Raymond Fagel in that um, uh, it, there is this direct connection, uh, but in in uh, uh, I think what's interesting also is that there's a kind of a range. You have a spectrum. So from um, a, a typical personal letter to a very sort of kind of, of, uh, of official type of, of diction. And we find um, all of the variants uh, in between. Things that are obviously from what could just be almost a personal uh, account of something all the way to uh, what was intended at the time, it sometimes uh, a dispatch is uh, written in the style of a newsletter. So then you have a kind of you know transformation. So there's uh, uh, a kind of interplay between uh, the two genres. But that's a very interesting point, the one you made. And if I may add, maybe there's also a development in time. I yes. look at the early stages of the Dutch Revolt, and it might be that then they're still using these letters, but then in the 17th century a much more elaborated system will be uh, organized probably. And then the connection with the original letters may be less. There's also, it's, it's, it was the good thing that was a very long conflict. So they had time to learn. <laughs> very true indeed. And in the chat, uh, Professor Roberts also adds indeed that personal letters themselves were already uh, distributed among more people, of course, than the uh, original recipient. And I think indeed like this, yeah, the copies and the origin of these newsletters is also one of our main concerns uh, in the Euronews project. And then I would now like to go to the question uh, of Andrea Di Carlo. Uh, welcome, Andrea. We can't hear you right now, Andrea. You need to uh, un unmute yourself. Is that okay now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for this great and thought-provoking pr presentation. I have a question for Dr. Alitsta. Uh, you mentioned Hamlet 
uh, in your in your presentation, has M Macbeth also been used? Um, yes, Macbeth uh, is one of the. Um, uh, it's, it's been used quite often during periods of conflict. Um, very prominent during, for example, the um, French Revolutionary uh, Wars and the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and, a, and a really interesting play in, in that respect because um, it was used, uh, the same performance was read in quite uh, different ways depending on your political sympathies. So they had a um, John Philip Kemble who was uh, a staunch royalist and opponent of the revolution in France. Um, sort of read this play as uh, a warning against um, anarchy um, and, and sort of performed and sometimes made textual changes to the play. Uh, but then um, the proprietor of the very same theatre that he performed at, um, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, um, had very different uh, views on the revolution and he was attacked and presented in, in political prints as one of the, um, the, the, the witches um, and, and criticized for um, his theater being a kind of harbor of regicides. Um, so Macbeth is, is definitely one of, of the, of, of a very malleable play um, during wartime and for expressing even within the same production, um, really different uh, views. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the question and for the answer. And uh, then we now go to uh, Tristan Griffin. Uh, good, good afternoon. Just wanted to thank again, as the previous uh, questions have done, all of the speakers. Wonderful to see cultural history approaching military history. Um, this is my neck of the woods. I had a question for Dr. Nina Lamal concerning it might be slightly outside your um, normal frame of work, but I was wondering whether you'd looked at the um, ex the Marprelat Press and the Scottish Covenanters in the wars of the, at the beginning of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, articulating essentially with a press in London to articulate their positions to an in to the English public, where whether it's international relationships, these are two separate states with a common sovereign. Um, I'm not sure, but I was just wondering whether, again, you'd looked at the uh, Wars of the Three Kingdoms and how the various combatants, both opposing factions within single states and rival factions controlling different states of the Stuart dynastic agglomerate, um, presented themselves to the reading public of um, the other parts of the Stuart monarchy. No, I, I, I haven't looked at um, any of that. Um, I'm really a, histor a historian of Europe and the island of, uh, right. of, of England. I leave to, I leave to others. Um, so no, but there is some great work being done on, on the presses and how they try to communicate with others. So there is, there is certainly a lot of literature on the topic. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry. And, um, <laughs> And um, yeah, I can send you some if you if you like, but no, I haven't done any work on that. Um, that that reading list would be frankly extremely welcome. I'll send you an email later. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to uh, the both of you. So remember that officially would go until a quarter past uh, five, but I propose I I think that maybe we could go on a little bit longer if people are uh, okay with that. So therefore, I would now like to go uh, to the next question of the co-creator of the digital ex exhibition, uh, which is uh, Maurizio. Are you... Thank you, Aris. Thank you, uh, Alter. Uh, just have a, a few notes and a, and a question, actually. About, uh, for Dr. Lidster, we have not Shakespeare, but we have a Shakespearean quote in our exhibition. In a, you know, the last entries, as happy as it had taken Ostend, which is taken from the um, a tragedy, the, the comedy, actually, the return from Parnassus. And uh, it, yet it's not Shakespeare, but it's as far as, as close as Shakespeare to, to Shakespeare as we can go. And then I have a question just for uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Fager and uh, Professor Pullman. In all these various uh, points of view, uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Dutch, pro-Alba against Alba, 
uh, is the, how strong is the awareness, the idea that the war is also a, a civil war, the revolt is a, is a civil war, and how is today, how this point of view is considered today in, a, in present studies, if, if you are aware of that. Thank you. Should I start, or what's the, what do you think, Raymond? You can start. I think it's okay. an easy question for you. Okay. Well, um, um, today we are. Um, um, the war was considered to be a civil war at the time, um, uh, but um, that perspective was more or less um, lost, uh, you might say, uh, from as early as the 17th century to. Um, uh, the, the 1930s. Um, there's you know, a number of reasons for that. Um, uh, an important one, maybe the general observation of Damis Armitage that nobody likes to have to remember civil wars, uh, only other people's civil wars or uh, because uh, civil wars are not really very uh, heroic or national or they, they cause problems as it were. Um, um, it's also clear that um, uh, the um, most peace de agreements in the early modern period, of course, um, um, stip started by stipulating that um, everything would be forgotten. And um, the Dutch revolt was no exception to that. So in 1576, for instance, but also in later accounts, there, there are the... Um, the, the warring parties agree to forget. And um, this doesn't mean that they literally forget, but it does mean that they rewrite the stories in such a way that they're better aligned with the outcomes of the conflict. And that means that uh, for the, the Dutch revolt, that the Dutch, the, 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 you might say the history of the conflict has mainly been written by um, uh, uh, in Protestant Europe has, has been written by the Dutch um, and they didn't want to see it as a civil war, they didn't want to remember it as a civil war. So that perspective had to be re recovered, you might say. Um, the, the first person to highlight that again is from 1930s, but it's really Henk van Nieropo in the 1990s, late 1990s, more or less also in the wake of the Yugoslavia conflict. Uh, started to pick up again on that perspective, and we're still working that through, as it were. Um, at the same time, it's probably so that um, this, the moment where that war ends and becomes another sort of war is still under debate. So you might say it starts as a civil war, but at what stage the civil war actually ends and it becomes a regular war between states, as it were, um, it's not so easy to pinpoint, and I think it also depended a bit on who you were talking to. So many of the people who had fled the Southern Netherlands, for instance, um, were very keen uh, war proponents of continuing the war until well in the 17th century, precisely because they wanted to go home. So for them, it was still a war that was, you know, that was that that could only end once Protestants were back in power in Ghent and Bruges, and Bruges as it were. So just like hope that, hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If nobody has anything uh, to add to that, I think it was, it was a very interesting uh, answer and a very interesting question, of course. Um, then let's see, actually, we only have still one question left. So maybe that would actually leave us uh, right on time or more or less right on time. Uh, David Boerio, do you uh, do you have? Yes, thank you, uh, Thank you so much. I'm so excited for this uh, for this uh, conference, this panel. But also, let me share uh, the excitement that I've been the winner of the transcribus competition, and I have found out on Twitter now. So it seems that I have got some of thousand credits to spend, and maybe Sarah will be very happy about that. Um, and then also, I'm also glad to see some friends uh, here, like Nina, last time was 10 years ago, I think, and uh, uh, I hope you are fine. So my question was um, uh, one, and can be also related to the two uh, talks. 
Um, uh, one is for uh, Professor Pullman. You talk about absence in a way and memory. Um, and, and you said that the great production of news uh, didn't in a way find a way into the creation of a shared memory. And one of the way in which that memories um, are shaped and shared is through the construction of an hege hegemonic discourse which is mostly fueled by those who remain and control the, especially the means of production and I'll say the printing press. So I'd like to ask you uh, if you have also considered this kind of synchronic idea of those memory who find a way in the printing press and all others who are completely dispersed in many various way of writings and in many various way of uh, also, you know, like traces. I was thinking, for instance, the orality, and I was, I was thinking to the great article of Mark Bloch, where at some time, where in, in point he used as a source, a kind of a Belgian, um, I don't remember, Belgian kind of a memory on the legend. No, mm -hmm. this, this idea of orality and, also, I would like to thank the first speaker for the great bibliographical advice of Angelo Turre. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Do you want me to respond quickly? Um, uh, yes, I did consider that, or my research team did consider that, and also very much material memories, uh, things in the landscape, things of place. So I was thinking about that in Anka Fischer Katnas. Um, 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 we did think about that, but, mem but um, um, uh, there are clearly traces, but those traces also need, uh, if, they if they are to be transmitted a bit longer than um, uh, one generation, they need somebody to give them meaning. And uh, meaning is, are not self-evident anymore in piles of paper, as it were, unless somebody creates uh, meaning or practice, you know, practices surrounding it or whatever. So um, obviously, you know, there are many ways in which early modern Europe creates meaning that are not printed. Uh, processions, annual feasts, uh, saints, uh, you know, to celebrate, uh, saints days to celebrate victories, whatever. Um, but um, what strikes me is that um, we are in our thinking about war, we need to, you cannot take it for granted that the episodes that have been written about most in the historiography, especially national historiography, are actually the episodes that mattered most to contemporaries. So in a way, thinking about memory has made me think harder also about the reality underlying the, um, and you can see also the voices that you never hear. I'm convinced that there is a, I can't, I can't explain this but but I think that the fact that there's so many foreign soldiers fighting for the Dutch for the Dutch Republic means that some of these memories also you know dissipate quickly in from Dutch national memory but not in Italy or not in uh, huh? in among Spanish the Spanish chronographs of, of Raymond Fajo for instance if I can just briefly add um, a word I I think this is this is why I like the idea of, of um, thinking about place because it kind of takes us away from this 19th century concern with national history and its chronological um, prejudice somehow um, because it, it focuses us on, on what has survived and um, this more the spatial approach and thinking about place and acts um, allows us to look for these um, the, the little traces that we can find of these of practices of things that have been said and done um, in those in war um, and yeah of the materiality as well so thinking about these letters and the, the, the bloody stains on them um, that's a completely different um, way of approaching that than I think yeah this I'm, I'm sorry to, to repeat it but this 19th century nationalist historiography <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have anything to add? Brandon, do you still want to say something? Just wanted to um, add a, a final word of um, 
of thanks uh, for this um, extremely fascinating. I'm also grateful for um, it, so much attention paid to our, our uh, exhibition. That's a, a very hopeful sign. Uh, and um, the, the impact clearly has, has been felt. Uh, and you've also given us an enormous amount of food for thought in our further explorations of this uh, key theme. I have to just say one final thing about the, the, um, uh, the vast amount of territory we've uh, managed to cover in, in uh, just over two hours, uh, both spatially and, and um, uh, geographically and, and, uh, and chronologically is um, extraordinary. And um, I'm particularly impressed that uh, one thing that did not come up in any of our discussions was um, the um, current conundrum that we're currently um, uh, living in, in regard to um, uh, the um, media and war that's occurring in our midst. Uh, I think that's a, a, a strong sign of our concentration on, on, uh, on scholarship. But I would also like to uh, make a sort of hopeful um, comment saying that, uh, well, it, it, certainly I think that the mutual comprehension between um, scholars on war in the wars going on in the past and the present, well, I think can be very uh, fruitful. And, uh, also possibly a, um, uh, uh, an antidote uh, to the monstrosities that uh, are occurring at uh, our door doorstep as we uh, continue to be more and more reminded uh, about the uh, absolutely essential connection between uh, war and culture. Uh, the two seem to be kind of uh, evil twins or uh, or um, uh, fighting brother and sister or sister and brother, uh, difficult to separate one from the other. And I think we've shown that in our discussions uh, today. And I think we'll all be um, bringing many of these perspectives back to our uh, work as we continue our productivity and hopefully continue our um, uh, our conversations. Um, I'm thinking of, of possible follow-ups uh, that we might have, but um, now that um, we've uh, experimented with the possibilities of, of this topic and this, this uh, format, surely you will be informed about uh, whatever the next steps will be. And once again, thank you so much. And um, uh, I think at this point we can bring the formal proceedings to a conclusion. What do you say, Voter? Uh, yeah, I agree. I just want to thank, of course, uh, all the panelists and also everybody um, who just came here to participate tonight, uh, this afternoon. I think it was uh, it was very it, it was a really great afternoon. Right and great. And um, any particular comments you can please um, quickly put into the. Uh, uh, the chat, which um, we're going to leave open after we close here, and uh, we'll uh, uh, save it so we can refer back to it if there are, are uh, links or specific bibliographical suggestions or whatever. So thanks to all of you. And hope to see you all again. <laughs>